Each of us here today has an infinitely unique story. Your path of discipleship involves embracing your imperfect story and sharing who you are in a way that meets the world's great needs. I'm a social worker and a researcher. In those roles, I listen and support people as they deal with devastating change. Most of my work has been with refugees of diverse backgrounds. Right now, over 100 million people are forcibly displaced. This equates to 100 million individual stories, like a young woman named Daria from Ukraine. After leaving her country, Daria talked about her experience. She said, I never really thought about refugees before because it was never something I thought might happen to us. I never imagined I would find myself, experience war and find myself in this situation. Forced displacement alters people's stories. It changes life chances and what people envision for their future. In my personal life, I've also experienced what at times felt like disappointing detours. As a young person, I expected my life to proceed in a particular pattern. But by the time I turned 25, after graduating from BYU with a bachelor and master's degree, I found myself living alone in Japan, divorced, and working outside of my chosen field. I also somehow ended up with this crispy blonde hair that ensured I stood out in Asia. <laughs> Though I had a great network of support, I had to reevaluate who I was and how I understood the world. As I biked through narrow, winding neighborhoods on long rides to work, I slowly found a deeper sense of peace. As I was cared for by friends and challenged by intense students, I started to find a new sense of direction. When our journeys take unexpected turns, we have a chance to reevaluate where and how we fit. Grief can stem from the pain of change, as well as the loss of hopes that were tied to a homeland, a relationship, or an identity. Adjusting to a new reality can be especially hard when we falsely believe that only one path involves happiness, or only one path indicates a manifestation of God's love. God loves us in all the aspects of our stories. Daria and her family will continue to adjust to life in Moldova as they watch what is happening back home. As I have adapted to new life landscapes, my ability to seek and feel the fruits of God's love has been a great strength to me. I believe that loving God can ground us as we face global and personal challenges, and following Christ as his disciples can help us access the transformative power of love and grace. To consider how our unique journeys can benefit the world around us, I'll explore three interrelated components of discipleship. First, knowing and valuing who you are. This is foundational. Second, learning to see and love others with empathy. This is where we draw on that foundation to build understanding and connection with other people. And third, choosing lifelong service. This becomes a manifestation of our discipleship as we build and strengthen the world around us. The path of discipleship starts with knowing and valuing who you are. Knowing ourselves means we are aware of the identities, desires, and experiences that shape us. Valuing ourselves means we strive to accept and appreciate who we are as inherently worthy of joy and love. As a global human family, we are both alike and unique. As a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I learned from a young age that I am a child of God. This most central identity is shared with every human being, and it unites us as siblings with equal claim on a God who loves all people. We are also unique in the identities and, and life circumstances that influence who we are. My characteristics as a white woman in the United States influence my life chances and how you see me, as do factors like my social class, ability, sexual orientation, legal status, and family status. Our uniqueness allows us to learn from and rely on each other. Consider the uniqueness of the lilies of the field. They grow towards the sun without shame at their beauty and without envy for the other gorgeous flowers around them. Within any group, an individual has both shared and unique characteristics. Among refugees, for example, it is common to experience loss, trauma, and hope. 
A woman who leaves Syria shares some characteristics with all refugees. She also shares experiences with some groups of refugees, but in other ways, she is like no other refugee. With any identity you have, for example, as a BYU student, you too have something in common with every other student, something shared with certain groups of students, and in other ways, you are wholly and only yourself. Finding what we have in common and what is unique about us can help us appreciate our shared humanity as well as our individual gifts. As we grow and struggle, we continue to discover who we are. When there are aspects of ourselves or our experience that we don't like, it can be tempting to pretend these don't exist. But when we are hurting or hiding, energy is constantly drawn back to those unaddressed issues. As if living with a festering wound, the untended hurt becomes difficult to heal and grow. Especially when feeling stuck, helpful resources for knowing and valuing who we are include prayer, honoring our agency, and finding supportive communities. Prayer is a conduit to connection with a generous and patient God. Prayer involves recognizing our deepest desires, learning how to ask better questions, and listening to that which is beyond our limited understanding. In Malaysia, I worked with Muslim refugee women from Somalia who described a range of prayer practices. They repeated key phrases and engaged in consistent prayer in ways that helped them find peace and stay close to God. I feel closest to God when I'm alone in places like the mountains, parks, or the temple. Daily prayer and reading of the Book of Mormon, attending church meetings, and listening to church leaders are also avenues for me to receive spiritual guidance and strength. Through prayer, I've felt God's love for me not only as a child of God, but as a person who makes mistakes and as a person with a range of identities and experiences. Each of these play a role in who I am. Seeking God through prayer can help us see aspects of ourselves that God already recognizes and embraces. Another tool for knowing and valuing who you are is to honor your agency. So much of what we do and become is based on what we choose. While we may face some physical or cultural limits, recognizing agency allows us to be deliberate in exploring all our options and considering how to stretch into our unique gifts. My new stretch for this year has been rock climbing. Though my physical limitations indicate I probably won't reach an expert level like this, my potential in this sport is determined most by my desires, efforts, and the support I receive along the way. Agency can also help us choose how to approach things outside of our control. For displaced people, policy priorities and xenophobia create barriers to safety and growth. In some cases, refugees remain in detention-like camp conditions for decades. But even in the face of restricted opportunities, people find ways to thrive. As we finished a support group with refugee women from Afghanistan, the facilitator shared this fantastic cake with candles and the words, have smile of forever. <laughs> After working through hard things like discrimination and violence, women also took time to celebrate and laugh. Even within limits, we can find ways to grow and shine. Most of us face constraints regarding what we can study, where we can go, and what type of contribution we can envision making. But don't confuse the few real limitations you have with false limits that are not from God. Flowers grow differently based on whether they are planted inside or outside the house, in a garden or out in nature. Let the sun reach you where you are. Stay open to God's guidance and the dreams and desires that will help you find how to share your gifts and your vision. In addition to prayer and agency, another resource for knowing and valuing who you are is to find supportive communities. Some aspects of your experience may be stigmatized or difficult to talk about. Finding a place to work through challenges can bring healing and a sense of your inherent value. In groups with refugees, talking through difficulties and building coping skills leads to improvement in mental health. Helpful strategies include mindfulness, deep breathing, visualization, exercise, stretching, recognizing and accepting a full range of emotions, and taking time to relax and play. These practices also help me manage stress and find peace. 
When you struggle with pain, disappointment, and sin, find people and practices that help you see your inherent value. When needed, access professional help to maintain well-being and self-worth. God is the ultimate source of life and grace. Christ invites us to come with broken hearts as God's love gathers us as a hen gathereth her chickens. I love this image of being tucked or cuddled under those nurturing wings. Especially in times of darkness and need, I have sought and felt that protective embrace from our Savior. Knowing and valuing our full selves, including the complexity and griefs that are a part of our story, centers us on our path of discipleship and allows us to look outward. I don't know what it's like to be a refugee. I don't know what it's like to lose the ability to walk or to lose a child or to go through things I just haven't faced. Even when we share characteristics, we never fully understand someone else's experience. But I want to know as much as I can, and I want to serve those who are different from me. Acknowledging our situations with openness before God brings redemptive power to repent, forgive, and act. In working through weaknesses and pain, we can access God's power for healing and hope. With this this foundation of self-awareness, we see others with fewer blinders, and we serve with fewer unintended consequences. A second aspect of discipleship is learning to see and love others. Christ taught us to love our neighbor and to love our enemies. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, Christ framed the relationship between neighbors as involving people who typically do not interact. The neighbor Christ asked us to emulate is someone from a marginalized background who sees and responds to a person in crisis. We, too, can see the people around us, and we must be willing to see their inherent value before we can effectively serve. The philosopher Martin Buber framed relationships as involving either I and it or I and you. The I-it approach occurs when we view others as objects or a means to an end, like someone who simply slows me down in line at the grocery store or makes me feel uncomfortable because of their style of clothing. When people are merely objects in our way, we limit them and we limit ourselves. In contrast, the I-you perspective, also framed as I and thou, involves genuine encounter with complex and eternal beings. Approaching people with this sense of openness moves us beyond control, stereotypes, and objectification. Whether a stranger or someone you've always known, every person is capable of surprising and teaching you. With most people we encounter, we have similarities. When working in Malaysia with people who were HIV positive or at high risk for HIV, Catholic and Muslim men with male partners talked about how prayer brought them feelings of calm and of light. A transgender woman shared how prayer brought solutions and healing when she was in prison. My faith is strengthened by the belief and spiritual experiences of others. In addition to appreciating similarities, we can welcome differences without, with curiosity instead of fear. When I was an undergraduate student at BYU, my best friend Melody was an international student from China with different religious beliefs. Our initial encounters involved laughter about language differences and getting through Economics 110, but our friendship grew because we had fun being together. What started as time with time as roommates and our first trip to New York turned into a lifetime of friendship and adventures in Asia and elsewhere. Who are you first drawn to in a class, neighborhood, or church setting? There are people in our communities who do not feel seen and welcomed. Among refugees who resettled to the U.S., many experience discrimination due to religion, accent, and appearance. When describing the importance of genuine friendship with neighbors and the difficulties of being accepted, one young adult said, I will never fully belong here. We can be better at finding similarities and appreciating differences. Reaching out to those on the margins can be helpful to them, and it can be transformative for you. At the heart of learning to love and see others is desire and openness. But there are also practical skills you can learn, even across differences that seem daunting. In winter semester, I teach a class on direct social work practice. 
On the first day, we talk about human interaction and brainstorm a list of skills that help us effectively engage with people. As a class, we choose the most central overarching skills. While many skills are valuable, we typically land on empathy as the most important skill. Students define empathy as feeling with people and joining others with compassion. In scripture, the phrase mourning with those that mourn captures the essence of empathy. Alma pairs the people's desire to come into the fold of God and to be called his people with a willingness to bear one another's burdens that they may be light and to mourn with those that mourn, yea, and comfort those that stand in need of comfort. This ability to join people in grief and to share burdens is part of the baptismal covenant, and it is a skill we can strengthen. Empathy is primarily about listening. Empathy allows us to trust and respect what another person experiences, to join them for a moment on their journey. In many cases, this requires us to put our own agenda, needs, values, and experiences to the side. We may be shocked by what someone experienced or believes. It may be completely foreign to us or uncomfortable or something we believe is wrong. Empathy is still possible. Jesus Christ demonstrated empathy through awareness of others in all encounters. He mourned with people as they grieved a lost loved one. He listened to people's stories. After his resurrection, when visiting the people of the Book of Mormon, Christ perceived their thoughts and feelings and recognized their desires. He responded with compassion and chose to stay present. After blessing and praying for the people, he said, my joy is full. And when he had said these words, he wept, and he took their little children one by one and blessed them and prayed unto the Father for them. And when he had done this, he wept again. Christ teaches us here how to love in a way that brings a fullness of joy. I've been inspired by students who demonstrate empathy for people who committed serious crimes and for people they formerly feared or dismissed. There are moments working with refugee communities where I've witnessed rage, need, and resignation. One late weekend night, I had a chance to bring a young Burmese client home from the hospital for a short visit before he returned for an additional lengthy stay. He had already been hospitalized for months, and it was difficult for his family to visit regularly due to limited public tr transportation access and work schedules. Seeing the way that family embraced their brief time together and showed love for their son was profoundly humbling for me. To be present with others during moments of vulnerability allows us to feel God's grace for them and for us. Valuing ourselves and showing empathy for others provides a framework for lifelong service. Jesus modeled how to serve as he addressed people's deepest needs through knowing their hearts and knowing their context. Meaningful service doesn't involve attention-seeking or ignoring our desires. It's not an obligation we fulfill by pushing past our capacity. Lifelong service is a purpose of education at BYU. It's about channeling time, energy, and passion into living in a way that lifts others and improves our world. What gifts and vision do you bring to the challenges the world faces right now? There's no shortage of need as we live through an era of violence, greed, and oppression. In addition to the 100 million people who are forcibly displaced, approximately 20 million people leave their homes each year due to extreme weather events. Over 2 billion people only have access to contaminated water sources. Nearly 60 million children of primary school age do not have access to basic education. 22% of children under age five have stunted growth due to malnutrition. In the United States, over 10% of households have insufficient resources for food. 28 million people do not have health insurance. Disparities are widespread where infant mortality and maternal mortality vary drastically by race and ethnicity. Healthcare access, economic opportunity, and treatment within the criminal justice system also differ significantly based on a person's race and gender. Inequality continues to rise where more resources are controlled by a smaller number of people. Also in the US, over 45,000 people die from gun violence every year. Over 117,000 children are waiting for placement in a permanent home. 
Approximately 580,000 people are homeless. Over half of Americans are lonely, with rates higher among young people. Here on BYU campus, we are not immune to disparities and prejudice. Cultural norms limit women's opportunities and confidence. Racial and ethnic minority students can feel oppressed and unsafe, with some noting that people have normalized aggressive comments, and I feel like I have to prove myself. 38% of LGBTQ plus students do not feel valued as an individual at BYU, and 25% of these students feel unsafe on campus. These and other major challenges can feel overwhelming, but we can find solutions. We can envision a more just and loving world. Christ invites us to be yoked with him, and we can rely on his example and grace. As we listen without defensiveness, our growing consciousness can open to possibilities for change. We live in a time of unprecedented wealth, knowledge, and technology. Many of us have the great blessing of accessing specialized training and education. Many of us have abilities to choose what to do for work and how to use financial resources that surpass our needs for food and shelter. Your ability to address suffering starts with valuing who you are and learning to have empathy. More than a particular major, we need to feel responsibility for the world we share and to learn to see others as inherently valuable, regardless of their beliefs, racial identity, gender, sexual orientation, legal status, or other characteristics. The skills we need include creativity, teamwork, an ability to learn, and enough awareness to avoid doing harm. We need people who commit to nonviolence, to recognizing truth, and to seeing the humanity of all people. If you have the privilege of choosing how you will support yourself and your family, consider incorporating service as part of that path. And whatever you choose, service can be a central part of your work with colleagues, clients, and systems. In any life path, service is the manifestation of your discipleship. In social work, we talk about micro and macro level change. Macro change involves attention to policy, societal norms, and large scale systems. As a global community, we need people who can envision and work toward a better world. You will find a role as you learn about what is happening, exercise your constitutional right to vote, and see yourself as part of building a healthier society. Macro-level change most often happens slowly with the vision and effort of large groups of people. My work with refugee communities feels like a tiny drop in the ocean, but I'm grateful to be a part of envisioning and hoping for a world where immigration policies center on safety and well-being rather than profit and fear. When imagining migration solutions, I appreciate the story of the people of Ammon as described in Alma 27. As this group of refugees fled religious persecution, their former enemies chose to provide them with land and protection. A bright moment where the Nephites saw those in need as family. We too can seek solutions through prayer and in collective action. We can share and honor our faith while seeing those with different backgrounds as our sisters and brothers. In addition to addressing large-scale challenges, service at the micro level is pretty much always needed everywhere. This service involves efforts to lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen the feeble knees. Each person around us needs empathy, and many need help in finding solutions and resources. Lifting up the hands that hang down happens as we support people in choosing their own path forward. It takes time and patience to find solutions. When I reflect on my time as a caseworker with resettled refugees, the stories I remember most are those that were not neatly resolved. I worked with a, a brilliant mother who failed to qualify for a liver transplant. Before her death, she focused on finding support for her sons. In another case, a family moved into a great new apartment only to be forced to move out two days later due to unclear requirements. Many issues in people's lives and on a larger global scale will not be resolved quickly or in the way we want. Giving service does not guarantee we will fix things or reach a particular outcome. Service also won't necessarily provide a sense of worth. Seeking personal value in service is a recipe for taking on too much and becoming angry when people don't appreciate you. 
Your value is independent of any service you can give. Service is ultimately about sharing the fruits of God's love that we have so generously received. God will amplify our limited efforts and inspire transformation. Our great opportunity is to choose to share and to become a conduit through which that love and grace can come. As we go through life, choosing to love God and seeking to be a disciple of Christ can yield sweet fruit and moments of joy. Self-awareness, empathy, and service do not free us from disappointment. But God can turn mourning into joy, as even the aspects of our stories that we shy away from become essential aspects of our discipleship. The humility we gain from experience can help us see all who cry out for help as God's beloved children. As we join others on their paths, we will witness God's love for each human soul and God's ability to give beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. In Utah, I love the short moment in May where the mountains are bright green. During springtime in Japan, people gather to enjoy the cherry blossoms, and it is simply magical. Since my time there, every year I wait and watch for the spring blossoms. I hope you can celebrate the fruits and blossoms that come along your path of discipleship. I am grateful for the moments of insight, connection, and healing that I have been a part of, where I feel both joy and grace. As we, with others, wait upon the Lord, our strength will be renewed, and we shall mount up with wings as eagles. I know God will lift us as we, see, as we strive to see and serve this world. I leave you with my testimony that this gospel is God's work, and I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.